Welcome back everybody to me <clears throat> complaining about the Wheel of Time and today we'll complain about chapters 31 to 39 of The G Gathering Storm. Yes, um, this is the second to last installment. Tomorrow we'll talk about the end of it all and then we'll find out how shitty things will get in Towers of Midnight next week. I can't... yeah. I can't wait to get it over with, is what I'm trying to say here, right? <laughs> anyway, it's not all bad in these books. There's actually sometimes good things, and we'll talk about those as well. And, um, yeah, <laughs> let's do that, shall we? <laughs> well, cheers. All right. <clears throat> um, the shit is literally hang hitting the fan at this point. We have a bunch of things going down this time, plotline-wise. We check in with Matt. We spend a lot of time with Rand in, you know, the follow-up to what we saw later. Um, we have a bit of Egwene shit going down, like crazy Egwene shit going down. And we check in with Tuon for something that I think is interesting to look at. That's sort of what we need to talk about. So, where shall we start? Let's start with Tuan, because that's the quickest one, and um, the crossover with Rand is obviously there as well, and we talk about that. And then we'll find out why I think that's the best place to start with, all right? Okay, so... After the things that happened last time, Rand discovering true fire, what, uh, not true fire, the true, po uh, <laughs> the true power, which is apparently, maybe, directly from the Dark One, which is the question of why is it called the true power at that point? Well, you know, we're not asking here, we're not asking any questions. Uh, this is all beyond us anyway. <clears throat> he meets with Tuan, and uh, they have a discussion, and Tuan is like, nah, you gotta bow down to the Empress, which will be me in a second. Um, and Rand is like, no, fuck you, it's gonna be me, I'm doing whatever, and you have to do what I tell you, because I'm the Dragon Reborn. And then he just, like, um, looms over her, and she sees all the darkness gathering around him, which may or may not be the result of him using true uh, po the, the true power, or whatever it's called, Oh, we call it true fire, which doesn't make any sense, right? Either it's him using dark magic now, um, instead of dick magic, or it's just something about him having less and less emotions and whatnot. Um, we don't know. And, uh, yeah. She says, no, fuck you, Rand. And they just uh, leave and both do crazy things. She decides to um, send her big raid towards the, the White Tower because she still thinks that Rand is working with the Aes Sedai of the White Tower, which obviously he isn't. But, you know, we've already established the fact that one important thing about these books is that no one ever shares information, which, you know, may be one of the big themes, like, go talk to each other, which is a pretty good message, right? All right, um, so that's that's why I wanted to pull up this one first. Now let's look at the Rand things. So, um, we're in Abu Dhar, not Abu Dhar, I keep, I, I, I can't remember the name of that place. We're in, you know, Aridaman in that city that has like two words and uh, yeah. Um, first we see a lot of, like, um, Nynaeve seeing how Rand is becoming harder and harder and things need to change. And she decides to do the thing, um, this is leading somewhere, I promise, right? So she decides to do something on her own to show to Rand that she can be trusted so she can guide Rand. Um, what she does is she finds out that, um, both that messenger and the, um, that that maybe knows where the king was, um, is dead and was, you know, tortured and uh, the merchant that was, you know, is now also being poisoned. They were both got poisoned by a dark friend, well, not a dark friend, by someone under Grendel's compulsion in that torture place. And the story there is, like, it's solid, at, you know, she's walking around, doing things, whatever. She discovers that, Rand's like, ah, compulsion, now we know it's Grendel. <laughs> and um, after his disastrous meeting with Tuan, he's like, all right, fuck it, let's nuke Grendel. By which I mean Balefire, but you know, it's the same thing. He basically nukes Grendel. And he does that, and everyone is like, oh, you should not use Balefire, it's terrible. Also, all these casualties, and we come to the same issue. 
We got told that Balefire is terrible because it's, you know, unraveling the weave and everything, And right? We've heard that before. We've heard that before again and again and again. And what do we get? Well, someone feels like this thing, like, like a... a <laughs> <laughs> like the world feels weird it's you know the kind of thing a disturbance in the force basically and that's it and i'm like all right <laughs> you need to do better if you want to tell me how really really bad this shit is there should be like actual consequences like re real consequences because we've we've bail fired a lot of people in these books so far you remember that whole thing that that whole shootout with ravine all the way back in Lord of Chaos, or was it? No, it was even Fires of Heaven, right? In Fires of Heaven, yeah, no consequences whatsoever, except the good consequence of bringing Matt and Avienda back to life, which, neat trick. Um, so there we go. Um, which I guess um, gives us a question, is Matt still blower of the horn? I doubt it, because you know, he's dead. He was dead and like returned to life through that whole thing, but you know, there we go. Um, not my point, but so far the consequences of using Balefire have all been positive. And if you come with like, yeah, but you know, the weave is unraveling. So what? The dead are walking. We have all these things and everyone's like, that's the dark one. So, <laughs> how, how does Balefire have any consequences again, apart from like everyone saying, ooh, it's evil. <clears throat> yeah, so what? Um, I, I feel it's it's once again part of this whole like show don't tell kind of thing because you tell me both both Robert Jordan and Brandon Sanderson tell me that Balefire is evil and dangerous, but they don't show it. There's no no visible consequences so far that make this a dangerous choice or maybe even the wrong choice. And I assume that if it's the wrong choice, but they really need it, someone will discover a way to do it with, that will, will discover a way to bail fire without consequence. Maybe they call it something else like unbail fire or whale fire or whatever. We'll see. But I'm pretty sure something, a workaround will come up at some point soon because all these things will, you know, everything will be good at the end. There's an interesting aspect to the whole thing, though, and that is, after Rand Balefire's Grindel's place and kills her with Balefire, so supposedly she's dead now. Hopefully she won't come back. Uh, whatever. Um, now Neve is like super shocked and goes to the wise ones and Cad's ones like, you gotta help me. You gotta let me into your plans for Rand because we need to do this um, together. And she gets in and she's supposed to, you know, um, do actual <laughs> do, do menial jobs for Cad's Wayne and the wise ones. Maybe get fed some tidbits of their larger plan. While at the same time we have a very dangerous thought of Min um, earlier or later, it's around that time, where Min is all about um, how Cadswain and even Nynaeve don't understand Rand because what Rand needs is not guidance or people telling him what to do. What Rand really needs is someone to help him. And I'm not saying this is where this is going, but I'm saying this is a distinct danger of where this can be going in the near future. And I have no idea if it will be the, if this will be the case or not, because I, you know, haven't read further on yet. But the idea that men being violent and dark and all of these things need women who understand them and help and help them and save them. That's the basis for every toxic fucking relationship in the fucking book. No, you can't fix other people by help and understanding. No, you should not even think that way. What you should think is that no matter the partner in a relationship or any other thing, work with them, understand them, talk with them. I thought that was the point of the entire series. Conversation, honest conversation on a level playing field. <clears throat> no, oh, I can forgive him all his violence, his mass murder and all of that, war crimes that he's committing because he's hurting so much inside. That will lead you down a terrible, terrible way. You don't do that shit. And yeah, I, I hope this is not the message that we'll get out of all of this, but right now it feels like that's the, uh, the message. And it's not one that I like. Um, I mean, 
it's not what that I want at all. It, it's it's really really dangerous. It's these small bits and pieces in there that you know pop up even with Brandon Sanderson, where you see like there's a certain level of misunderstanding where how these things go, or like a certain level of misogyny that's still around. There was this other uh, scene with uh, the oh the, the chapter that I spoke about uh, before, right? Chapter thirty, uh, twenty nine, thirty. 30. Um, uh, the one called Old Advice. <laughs> Never trust a pretty woman <laughs> or an Aes Sedai. And I'm like, the Aes Sedai of it, whatever. But never trust a pretty woman. And then bear that out in your fucking story is not good at all. Because so far, we don't see the idea that this kind of, you know, advice is bad advice. Because, you know, physical attributes... I have nothing to do with trust, right? Like, uh, it, it's shitty. It's really shitty and misogynist. And we, we see these kind of bits coming in here, like, on both sides. Like, how how the relationship between the, like, men and women is described here. Now, yeah, don't. Just don't. Um... Now we need to look at another thing here, and that is um, justification for mass murder, right? Wonderful. So uh, Rand bail fires the entire place. The problem is, it would just it would be just as bad if he had used some other power thing or whatever uh, to kill all these people. He basically kills, cause an intense amount of collateral damage to kill one person that he feels he has to kill. Not being grained all. Um, I, I I did choose the I did choose the word nuke, um, you know, deliberately here for that kind of thing because basically it's exactly that. It's like you have a goal and what you do is you do you know you drop those bombs over Hiro Hiroshima, Hiroshima, whatever, and Nagasaki to um, spread as much terror as possible. You have a very specific goal and you take all these all that collateral damage in it and afterwards. Hopefully, you feel really bad about it. I mean, that's the ideal case. <clears throat> and we know that at least some people that were involved in that kind of stuff in the, you know, World War II did feel really shitty about it because that is a very, very bad... Like, that's not a, the kind of decision anyone should make. And um, the point that we see here is Rand gets off lightly. He's like, I feel super bad for this. Yeah, I don't believe it, because in the next say, uh, sentence, you tell us that all those people, all those people were so deep under Grendel's compulsion that it would not have, that I, it was basically a kindness to kill them. <sighs> and that takes away all the, like, emotional and all the uh, moral or ethical, whatever you want to call it, like impact of the entire act it because basically it becomes okay to just kill thousands uh in order to you know get your goal because they're not really human at this point anymore and that's that's very very fucking convenient and it also becomes a problem because right after that what you do is you show us with the, the the you know the ruse where he sends that guy into the thing, lets him come out, see that he's you know all under compulsion. He kills Grendel, and then the compulsion has gone. And basically, what what it's claimed is that it works because you know Balefire goes back in a bit in history and makes the last couple of decisions on you know and makes them, and that's how it works. But is, is that really true? Does compulsion leave when the guy when the person dies, or because of the like Balefire things like? Because if the former, then you basically could have just like gone in and killed only grain doll, and all those compulsions would have like slowly unraveled and people would have had a chance to survive. We don't know, because there is that claim about Balefire that we, we never really learn anything more about because that's not what's in the world building here. Or yeah, we've just conveniently taken away all the moral like impact of the entire action that could have, you know, you could have talked about that afterwards and what that makes with people. Like, no, you know what? Actually, it was a kindness to all put them down because we've already established that euthanasia is something that is really, you know, totally fine in certain situ certain situations. Um, but mainly, mainly what I'm really annoyed about is literally how we. Um, <laughs> 
Sanderson and Jordan, I don't know who's, you know, the guy who really came up with that specific aspect and pointing it out, how we basically take away every form of like moral weight to the actions of our characters here, because yeah, those other people in there, they're really people, so it's fine to just kill all of them. And I'm like, you're making it very, very easy for yourself there, good sir. And that's something that I've established, like, not established, but that's something that I've um, realized for the entire se uh, series, whenever, whenever our characters do something objectively or subjectively wrong, bad, right? What happens is that the actual like impact gets softened a lot by weird plot devices, right? R Rand goes and kills Leah, the, that one um, uh, maiden of the spear. But it's okay, because she was just like just devoured by uh, um, whatever that thing in Shadar Logoth is. It's not much in Shin, it's the other thing. Mashadar, right. She gets devoured by Mashadar, so basically killing her is a kindness. And yes, he'll still feel bad about it, but literally it doesn't have the same impact as Rand is killing an innocent person. And we have a lot of these situations here, and it's it's one of the things why I can't connect with, with a lot of Wheel of Time, because whenever our characters are supposed to suffer all these terrible things for, and all this guilt for all their actions, it's like... Is, you know, you're telling me there's guilt, but there is no, because I, as the reader, know that there wasn't, like, any impact behind it. We know Moraine is alive. Rand does know. He feels that him him not killing Lanfear basically killed Mor Moraine. He's like, I don't know. That didn't come across as convincing. And none of these supposed guilts that our characters are feeling ever feel convincing. And that's something that I personally find really annoying. It's that, like... Um, um, disinclination to actually commit with your characters because you tell me they're all grey morally and have all these problems like really you just tell me you never show me at all alright so there we are um with that part. We'll see where all of this is leading. Nynaeve is now sent off to find Perrin, so Perrin can help Rand be human again. We'll see if that works out. <sighs> I guess in the next couple of chapters. There's not that many left, really. Um, ten, I think. Anyway, um, and we'll leave that part behind. Let's look at Matt real quick. So Matt <clears throat> is planning to find the person that is looking for him. And while he's making elaborate plans that are highly humorous because he's coming up with all these super funny backstories about all his characters, all his friends that are supposed to play these weird characters, and it's all over, it's a bit over, to over the top to create some form of humor because, you know, everyone needs a bit of a laugh after such a big one of mass murder, right? Um, it's fine. Uh, Varen shows up in his place, tells him how the pattern has drawn her to him, gives him a letter that he is to open after ten uh, days if she doesn't come back, <clears throat> then supposedly makes him a gateway so he can go to um, Camelin, where he will do whatever, and also start producing cannons. They're called dragons, but we all know what they are. They're cannons, and Eludra is going to build them for him for the final battle, because we need more modern armor at this point. <laughs> Not armor, but, you know, uh, weapons and shit. There's nothing much really about this one. It's okay. It kind of gains a bit of weight afterwards when we um, uh, talk about the chapter with Baron that we need to talk about in, like, chapter 39 in a minute. Um, <clears throat> but um, up until then, it's more like a slight humorous... Um, interlude between all the dark things happening in these couple of chapters because obviously s things are ramping up speeds ramping up uh, shit is coming is is happening finally because we have to get to like an actual end at some point so we need to actually get all these things that were set up by Robert Jordan sorted out quickly now sort of which makes it a bit weird that we spent so much time with unnecessary shit in the first half of this book but that's just what we have to live with, I guess. All right. 
Let's look at the Elaine, not Elaine, Egwene chapters here, shall we? And then we'll be done with it for today. So, Egwene's chapters. She is, you know, in a box. Not as bad a box as Rance, but we set up this parallel, uh, parallel and I'm good with the parallel. That's fine, you know. There's a lot of them, because Rand, Rand is doing something really mass murdery after his frustrating meeting with Tuon. You know, nuking Grandal. And Tuan is something uh, mass murdery after meeting with Rand, which is sending out the the rock and with that raid on the White Tower to, I guess, dressed in the living fuck out of that, out of that tower. I will see. Um, <laughs> it's a treat for tomorrow. <laughs> um, but. So you have that meeting that went wrong and both do something that is, in hindsight, supposed to be bad. We will find out how bad, but that's something for tomorrow. So after that, we have the parallel with, like, Egwene sitting in that small cell and still like, yeah, I will not be rescued <laughs> at all. <laughs> you need to wait. I have all, everything under control. And then she gets freed. Um, which is fine, because there's even more chaos, and uh, Sil Sylviana, the <laughs> mistress of novices, is like, yeah, you're doing something wrong, El Elida, and there's like a huge uh, uproar there. I, I don't really care, you know, that chaos is coming down, and she gets like <laughs> dragged back up to her place, um, uh, to her cell, and she finds Varen Sedai in her room. And Varen then tells her that she is a dark friend. Not only a dark friend, she's like Aja. But she only did it to spy on them. <laughs> and and uh, she tells Egwene everything, gives her a book with all the names of the black Aja, and then dies. <laughs> Why does she die? Well, she dies because the oath is that she cannot uh, reveal anything about the Black Aja until the hour of her death. So she takes poison that will act within about an hour, and then in that last hour of her death, uh, she tells everything to Egwene, revealing that she only did it to research the Black Aja and the Dark One and all of that stuff. <sighs> Yeah. <clears throat> There's a lot to that. We'll just get at the quick thing. Egwene starts telling uh, Swan in Telayan Riyadh in the Dreamlands about it and gets yanked back out because the Shan Chen are finally bombing the White Tower. <clears throat> and that's what we're going to talk about tomorrow because that's where I ended reading for today. Um, <clears throat> so let's look at the whole Varen situation and why I think it is not as good as it could be. There's a bunch of th uh, things around around it that I don't like. So, first one. Varen dies because of that poison. She even mentions that it is plan B. Plan A was to take the Oath Rod and, um, you know, get her Black Aja vows removed to then be able to speak. And we know that it's possible, because we've seen it happen before in that whole, let's like, use the Oath Rod to force people to tell things scheme. So plan A doesn't work because the Oath Rod is not there. It's somewhere, um, possibly with that group, because they're trying to do something with someone, right? Um, wonderful thing. Um, now, here's the problem. So Varen kills herself to tell um, Egwene everything and give her the book. And... It doesn't really sit right with me. And I thought about, like, why that is the case. And I think... So, there's, like, a bunch of things. That ending comes very abrupt. It, just like the death of Masima, this part just feels like um, Brandon Sanderson tying off plot threads to get rid of them. It's like, yeah, we have Varen around. We knew that Varen was doing things that she was not supposed to do way back in probably Lord of Chaos when she was, you know, fucking around with those... Um, other Aes Sedai um, that were um, captured by Rand after. Alright, in that case it has to be in Book 7, whatever Book 7 was. Um, Path of Daggers? No, Crown of Swords, I think. Uh, so we know that she's... We, knew, we already knew that Varen is Black Aja. Because he's doing all these weird things. And... Um, now we just have that threat brought to an end with that big reveal that is absolutely meaningless, and we'll come to that in a second. Um, 
And then we just conveniently kill her off because once again, having her survive the whole thing would raise all kinds of moral questions, all kinds of questions of justice. Is it like, you know, how do you deal with someone who did all of these things? Does her claim, I did it all for the light, hold all of these things. They are conveniently buried by her just, you know, taking the poison, right? That's very neat and leaves this once again a very sterile kind of bo book because we're <laughs> we are free of any moral questions here because conveniently she's dead. That's the first aspect of it. The next aspect is Varen Sedai as a character. Now I know she's a very beloved character by a lot of people and I understand that for all kinds of reasons. And we'll go through them now. And then we'll talk about like why her being actually not bad, but really good and going deep undercover feels a bit like a betrayal to me, personally. So, all right, Varen is obviously a very specific stereotype and cliche. You know, the, the really, the, the, the nerd with hidden depth. The kind of thing that we all, as young, up, grow, you know, <laughs> adolescent nerds, thought wished we were, right? It's like, I'm a bit awkward, I'm interested in all these wonderful things, but I have hidden, hidden depths and no one notices them. And it's, it's, it's a stereotype that you've seen in books and whatnot before. And all the brown Aja has that, but Verena is the one that we meet the most and she does it even more. And that, you know, there's reasons why we kind of like certain kind of people like that kind of character because up to a specific point, being that odd kid that was very much interested in books and nothing else and whatnot, you get bullied and shit. And having like role models like that, it can be helpful in that time. So I get it. The problem is having that one black Aja that is actually nice, that is actually really nice, helpful and cool, having that one turn out to actually be evil for one or other reason would, like, once again, raise questions. And we've, we've established before that in these books, everyone who is evil is evil, right? They're either, they're, they're either ugly and unattractive or behave like absolute dickheads. So having someone who is black Aja be nice and behave nice and not actually also be morally nice would raise all kinds of questions and kind of disturb the overall metaphysics of this world, which is where my betrayal comes from, where I'm like, yeah, you had the chance to have like a really interesting character be evil and then deal with the question of like, why did they do what they did? Is it, you know, because of your research um, can lead you down very dark pathways through like the moral gray area where you don't care what your weapons, uh, that your research can lead to weapons into like actually becoming that mad scientist kind of guy. Is it, would it be that? You could have done all of these things, but basically it's like, I was interested in the dark one, I researched, they caught me, I had to, I had to swear, so I did it, and then I'm now getting out with all this valuable information. Here's my honorable sacrifice. Is a much easier narrative to spin, and it's much easier to, you know, read that, because we want it to be that way. It's crowd-pleasing, it's not asking questions, it's not raising questions, it's not challenging the reader. And that's that's something that really kind of annoys me and pisses me off, because you have the chance and it's wasted. So, there we go. First of all, her death could have been avoided. It feels like we need to have her to kill her off so we don't have to deal with the problems afterwards. Because, yeah, the Oath Rod is not here. <laughs> Whatever. That's your writer's decision. You, you, Brandon Sanderson, or Robert Jordan, decided that you, you would be better off killing, that, killing off that character right now with their noble sacrifice, you know, your Boromir kind of <laughs> situation, than to keep her around and ask the morally challenging questions about what she did. Um... And you could have, like, asked the other way around, like, maybe she is good all the time, but re researching the Dark One leads to her doing all these Dark Friend things and killing innocent people and whatnot. How do you deal with that? Can you still consider her good or whatnot? 
all of that stuff wasted because we just conveniently kill her off to not ask those questions. And now we come to the big thing. Her sacrifice is so fucking meaningless. Um, not in the plot, but to the reader. It lacks impact because yes, she has this book with a long list of names of all these black Aja. But the problem is the ones that we care about the ones that we care about that are important, that showed up before a lot, at least. We already knew those were Black Aja as readers. Egwene doesn't know, but we as readers knew for all of them. Some we explicitly knew about it. You know, Elsa Penfell, we knew because we got a scene that tells all about that. Uh, both, um, you know, Galena Kasban and Katarina, whatever her name is. We knew about them. Because we have a scene of those two talking about it when they're on their way at the beginning of Lord of Chaos. <clears throat> we knew they were Black Aja. Even fucking Sheriam, we know that she's Black Aja because of that completely unnecessary scene two, three, like ten chapters ago. <clears throat> we already know. So for me, for us as readers, that list of names has no impact whatsoever. Yes, there's a bunch of names in there we didn't know, but frankly, we don't care because none of those characters did anything memorable. They're just names that show up and then we are dropped again. Because, yeah, there's another green sister with a name. So, whatever. I don't care about them. They, they had like minimal interaction with anyone. They just like walked down the corridor somewhere with someone else. And they... So for while this may be important news for Egwene, for the reader, it's just like, so whatever, right? <clears throat> Let's move on. And that's, that's, that's like the third part of why this whole scene is not as good as it could be. <clears throat> and you could have, like, solved that problem. Cut that stupid scene um, that I spoke about earlier with Shiryam. Nothing important happens in that scene. Yes, she gets told by Misana to go and fetch all those dream Dreamland keys. I don't think that will matter anymore, because we don't have that much time anymore, and Egwene knows now, so the whole dream, gathering all those dream terangrial thing will not happen in time for Sheriam to not be revealed as Black Aja, so you could have just like dropped that whole chapter, because it does nothing important at all. Drop that entire paragraph. Leave Sheriam as a reveal. Yes, we got clues before when, you know, when she's like crying and stuff like that. Yeah. <clears throat> There's something odd with Sheriam. Leave that in because puzzling out who is Black Aja, who is a dark friend, is one of the few, you know, joys these books give the reader. It's like, yeah, <clears throat> I can guess along, try to find out who is evil and who is not. But ramming it down my throat with no, like, actual impact on the story whatsoever... And then having her name show up in the book is like, yeah, no big deal. And you could have gotten more of like my personal like investment. If there had been like a couple names in there where I'm like, yeah, finally, big reveal. I'm shocked. Something like that. That would have been good. That could have been good. And it could have been avoided easily. Even with Alviaren, it would have been easy to just keep that in there in secret or whatever. <laughs> because even her interactions as Black Aja are not that important. Yeah, she's tor uh, she's tormenting Elida, but, you know, Elida is not Black Aja, so... Uh... I, uh, Alviar and could have just as well been, you know, evil for, or just like <laughs> a dickhead. It's possible, right? <laughs> but we don't. And the Sh uh, the Shiriam one annoys me in particular because it's so absolutely unnecessary. It does not add anything to have her revealed in a chapter before. It's like, why do that? <laughs> and it's it's Brandon fucking Sanderson's book. It's not even like, yeah, maybe Robert Jordan had different plans with Shiriam, so it, um, and it, it's like an older chapter. No, it's in this book. You had the power, you had the choice to drop that paragraph. And I'm pretty sure you could have even argued Harriet out of it, man, if that was the uh, sticking point. And that's just bad writing. That's what you actually should have an editor go over and say, you know what? Maybe get some, you know, impact for the reader, right? You know, putting names in there that mean something. Because they are, you know, important. With the whole, like, Egwene realizing that, yes, both her and Elida were propped up by Black Aja Keepers. That would have been cool. Because it is really cool to have that parallel thing going on again. It's not, you know, the, the most innovative... Uh, 
um, kind of literary device, but it's an effective one. It would have been cool to have that reveal. And I feel cheated by that. I feel really cheated by that because it would have been, you know, cool. And it would have given, like, from, like, a reader perspective, it would have given Varen's death and sacrifice a little more meaning. As it is right now, I'm sitting here and I'm like, yeah, well, I guess <laughs> Varen's, like, per continued survival would have raised too many complications that might have, you know, taxed the reader's brain. So maybe let's just kill her off in a heroic... Um, in a heroic like sacrifice, and then we're done, and that's 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 a shame. That's a real shame. <sighs> so yeah, that's where we are right now. The tower is getting attacked. Um, we'll see how that shit goes down tomorrow, and we'll see what happens with Rand, who is oh so grim and dark now, and a poor boy that needs understanding and love, and that's why we need women in our lives as toxic men. We need women to just, you know, feed our toxic masculinity by being understanding and whatnot. Maybe even, you know, and this is like a huge thing, right? Rand tries to attack men. He, in the end, it's under compulsion. I know, not compulsion, but you're yeah, forced by that thing. But she's like, yeah, but he still loved me. It wasn't really him. That's prime, that's prime domestic abuse excuse there. And tie it back in with the same character that, like, no one is trying to help the poor guy. I can do that. That's toxic as fuck. And it pisses me off. So, yeah. Um, I guess that's where we are. Meaningless sacrifices and um, another road down into toxic, um, into, into domestic abuse and um, toxic relationships. Good going, Brandon. I'm with you there. Well, see you tomorrow. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs>